and we are in the process of getting experience with this virus, learning uh, what its effects are in human beings. And um, uh, unfortunately, it has gotten to the point where it is spreading around the world and uh, having a severe effect uh, on the entire world, including our economies and, and uh, human suffering and, and, and illness, and in some cases, death. Uh, so, you know, what I would, uh, what I always like to do in my talks is, uh, because I love history, I like to go back a little bit in time and talk about history because uh, being a historian, uh, I think that history has, has things to teach us, which we can take into the present day. So we can modify our situation today to, to better ourselves. So let's take a look at the last pandemic. That means a worldwide epidemic that spread around the world. It was about 100 years ago. And by the way, uh, I remember uh, over the past few years, scientists have been predicting that we would get an, a pandemic. Uh, you know, we've been overdue for this pandemic, but every now and then uh, a contagious disease does get loose and, and go around the world uh, and have a, you know, significant effect on world population. A hundred years ago, it was a, an H1N1 virus, an influenza virus, uh, a particularly virulent strain that went around the world. It originated from a bird host, and it was so severe uh, that it infected within a year and a half or so, between uh, 1918 and 19, one third of the entire world's population. Uh, that was, we had a one and a half billion people then. Today we have over seven billion in the world. So uh, one third of all people were infected. It caused at least uh, 50 million deaths across the world. And in the United States, 675,000 people died. And we learned from this virus that um, the there, it was unusual in that uh, it did affect the young and the old, but healthy people in the middle of life were surprisingly severely affected. Between the ages of 20 and 40, there was a high mortality rate in these people who otherwise had no comorbidities. Comorbidities are prior existing medical problems such as diabetes or hypertension, or, you know, coronary disease. Um, so uh, surprisingly, it, it did have that effect. And to this day, we have not under, exactly understood why. Uh, we are beginning to understand how it affects young, how the coronavirus is affecting young people. We are beginning to have theories as to why this might happen, that, that this young, healthy age group might be so affected. So, Asha, can we bring up our first slide? Um, so, you know, we didn't, in 1918, 100 years ago, we didn't have a lot to combat the uh, virus. There were no, you know, today everybody, the government tells us to get influenza vaccines, right? And uh, even at the start, if we had a vaccine already in hand, uh, we could, have given it to everyone for coronavirus, and they would have been immune in a couple of weeks. We have no such vaccine. 1918, there were no influenza vaccines. So uh, basically what we were relying on to stem in, uh, contagious, uh, contagion rates and death rates was isolation, social isolation, whether it existed through quarantines of sick people or exposed people social distancing or the shutting down of, of gathering places. And we again see that happening and unfolding before our very eyes now in, in different stages. So I want to go through a list. This first part of the talk will consist of things that are valuable that we can do to help ourselves. 
to avoid uh, getting sick. And if we do get sick, uh, how we can best prevail. So, um, you know, remember that the coronavirus is spread, it's contagious via respiratory droplet. That means when someone sneezes or coughs or um, let's say sings or laughs or, or uh, forcibly um, expresses air from their lungs, it carries moisture in little droplets and the virus exits the body. If you are standing within six feet, uh, you can, and if someone is carrying this virus, you can then inhale the virus through this moisture and it can go into you and you can get infected. The other way that, uh, the other ways that you could potentially get this is if, um, you know, if this, these respiratory droplets containing the virus landed on a surface and then you touch the surface and then you brought your hands to your mouth or your face and it entered you. We are now also, in, in these recent weeks, maybe the past week, are learning that finally uh, we have found that this coronavirus is being shed in the GI tract, in the stool. So now we understand that it can be transmitted into the GI tract by swallowing and through fecal-oral transmission. So many ways to get it. But I just want to reassure you that the primary way, overwhelmingly, is through inhaling respiratory droplets when you're standing clo too close to someone who is sick or, or you know, uh, carrying the virus. That's why we've been all told to distance ourselves by six feet. Um, so I like to point to this chart that you're looking at because um, uh, in 1918, the Surgeon General of the United States, uh, when the uh, influenza pandemic hit the United States, sent out an advisory to all municipalities that they should take the, the utmost precautions in shutting all gathering places, you know, restaurants and bars and dance halls and movie houses and churches. and some municipalities complied, some, uh, some localities uh, laughed it off. And we see the difference in compliance in this graph. At the time, Philadelphia was the third largest city in the United States. St. Louis was the fourth. So they were neck and neck as far as populations are concerned. And you can see. Uh, what, what the difference in mortality rates is between the, the populations of these two cities. The mayor of St. Louis immediately took to heart the Surgeon General's advisory and shut down all churches, meeting halls, gatherings. Uh, Philadelphia did not. And what you saw happening was there was a huge spike of mortality very quickly as the virus spread like wildfire through the population. That's the first spike that you see. That was in Philadelphia. The second spike, the lower spike, was a more gradual infiltration, and a safer, with, a, with much lower, much, much lower mortality rate in St. Louis. The virus did stick around longer, but there was uh, much, much less of a death toll. So we've learned lessons from this, uh, these, this, these isolation techniques. And what we are trying to achieve in New York City and in Long Valley and in Patterson, New Jersey, and in, uh, wherever you are, it, we are trying to achieve St. Louis's spike, which is lower mortality, by keeping everything closed. Okay. Um, so I mentioned before that um, other than directly inhaling um, respiratory droplets that carry the virus from uh, 
people who are directly infected, probably the second most common route is from direct surface contamination uh, via the hands when you put the hands to the face. So um, it is really, really important that we keep our hands away from our face, uh, keeping the hands down. Uh, every, basically every couple of minutes, un or subconsciously, the average human being is constantly putting their hands to the face, adjusting the glasses, scratching a little itch, you know, rubbing their eyes, and, um, you know, this potentially brings the virus from a door handle or an elevator button that was lying there for hours or in, on some surfaces, this coronavirus can be viable for days. Let's say on a paper or a book, um, the virus has been known to survive for days. It brings it to your respiratory tract or your mouth, and then you inhale it, and then you get sick. So uh, we will, I've made a post, uh, and you're welcome to go to our Instagram. There was a wonderful New York Times article, uh, and I'll give our Instagram link for those of you who are unaware of it um, at the end of our um, end of our presentation. But there was a wonderful article on little tricks that you can practice to make sure you just keep your hands away from your face. Um, other suggestions are when you go out, uh, if, you're go if you must touch a door handle, to maybe either use gloves when you touch the door handle or maybe uh, some sort of a fabric or a piece of plastic to touch it and then dispose of it so you don't come in direct contact, your hands, with that potentially infected surface. Disinfectants. Uh, there, there's also a, a, was a wonderful article which uh, we have posted, and I'll give you the link at the end, on how amazing soap is. Soap, just plain old soap, is extremely a powerful agent in taking apart the coronavirus. Uh, it interferes with the coating of the jacket of the virus, and... Um, it's just extremely effective. You don't, it's not, although, you know, we do have chemicals like Lysol and we do have uh, alcohol like Purell that does work. Um, it's potentially, you know, soap is just as effective. Um, and that's why I did do this little hand washing video. I don't know if any of you saw it, but we'll, it's, it's on our, posted to our Instagram page. And, um, I demonstrated uh, ad nauseum the technique for, for the proper washing of hands to really make sure that there are no virus particles on the hand. And there are special techniques um, uh, involving how to uh, um, cover each surface of your hand with, with the soap in order to uh, be safe from transmitting the coronavirus to your face and to other people. Uh, again, we'll give you that link. So those are the those are the safety uh, kinds of things you can do. Uh, you know, wearing a mask out in public, it just it's not particularly recommended, and it's not known if you're just walking around in public that it could help you, uh, because uh, hopefully you're not coming in close contact, face to face with people. You should stay away. Okay. So that brings that that covers the general safety precautions. Let's talk about um, lifestyle when it comes to nutrition. In my book, uh, other than avoiding the virus, like we just talked about, this is perhaps the most powerful thing you can do. And the reason why it's so powerful is we have a lot of evidence that eating a high-level diet of whole plant foods um, primes your immune system to be so powerful um, and so calm. What do I mean by that? Well, eating a diverse selection of whole plants 
uh, and when I say that, I mean trying with the avoidance of animal foods and processed foods, select and rebalances the microbiome of our intestinal system. We have come to realize that our intestinal tract uh, contains trillions of microorganisms. Yes, viruses, but mostly bacteria and other kinds of organisms. Uh, and these organisms determine our state of health. They will determine whether we get cancer, whether we get diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, heart attacks, Alzheimer's. They're really the major factor in determining whether we're healthy or not. And we, in order to be healthy, you need exactly the right kind of ecosystem balance between all the thousands of different bacteria down there. And what provides that balance is the right feedstocks of plants that you put down into your intestinal tract. Um, so not only does putting the right the balance of plants uh, make your immune system extremely powerful and alert, but, but when the immune system does attack, it makes sure that the attacks are not so virulent that it takes you out, the, the good part of you out in the process. We have come to realize that for uh, many of these young people who have fallen ill, I, I talked about the, that surprising 20 to 40 year old age group that, that, uh, that had a high mortality rate from the 1918 pandemic, um, that their problem was not that they had diabetes or comorbidities or other sicknesses, their problem was that their immune system became so furious that it set off a, a, a horrendous chain of toxic events and, and, and unleashed horrific amount of lethal chemicals to try to kill the virus, but too much. It went overboard. And, and we now know that situations like this, uh, which are called the medical name is cytokine overdrive, when your immune system releases too many weapons, can result in, for example, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which turns out to be the number one reason why people are placed on ventilators and go into respiratory failure, which probably is the number one cause ultimately of death from coronavirus. And it is not because of the coronavirus itself, it's because your lungs start filling up with the fluid, inflammation, and toxic chemicals of your own attack. Now, mind you, this is not an autoimmune disease. It's not like rheumatoid arthritis where your immune system is attacking your joint surfaces or multiple sclerosis where it's attacking your, your immune system has targeted your, the, the the, ins the, the myelin or the sheathing of insulation on your nerve cells. It's not that. It's, it is attacking the coronavirus, but the weapons it's using are so powerful and there's so many that it just starts, it, you, you start to be taken out in the cross spider. So eating plant-based diets causes a very calm milieu in the eater, uh, very low levels of inflammation. Even when attacks are launched, they tend to be controlled and contained. So um, it is very important. Uh, I, and and we will we'll give you some, I've included in your reference list, some examples of how specific plants can help us, including, uh, for example, blueberries and cardamom, the spice, have been shown, shown to increase natural killer cells. Natural killer cells are special lymphocytes which come in and as soon as your immune, uh, um, your immune um, system signals that there's a, a coronavirus around, these lymphocytes come in to kill them. And we noticed that uh, cardamom and blueberries definitely increase the number of available natural killer cells. Uh, 
things like uh, mushrooms, uh, eating uh, between a half cup to a, a cup of mushrooms per day, cooked just the plain common white mushrooms, you don't have to get fancy, increases IgA levels. These are antibody levels that attack viruses in our secretions and our saliva. Um, and of course, our old friends, and this uh, the cruciferous vegetables, some of the most powerful foods known to mankind. Uh, they uh, cruciferous vegetables have a very specific molecule that is not found anywhere else in the world, in the planet, in any living or non-living thing. These molecules are sulfur molecules called glucosinolates, and these molecules have a keyhole receptor in our lymphocytes. Onions don't have it. Blueberries don't have it. Um, turmeric doesn't have it. Only every cruciferous plant has it. And uh, for those of you who are new to the plant world, if you don't know what cruciferous is, it is the broccoli, the cauliflower, the radishes, the turnips, the arugula, the watercress, the mustard greens, we could go on and on, the tatsoi, the bok choy, the Chinese cabbage, bro broccoli, broccolini, broccoli rub. There, there are about maybe 30 different varieties of cruciferous vegetables we can think of. These have special effects on the lymphocytes of our immune system, and specifically in our gut. Remember, that's why I told you our, our health is determined. It turn, turns them on and enables these lymphocytes to fight our battles for us. So having uh, eight ounces of raw cruciferous greens or vegetables every day is the order of the day when it comes to our patients. So that I, I don't want to be derivative at this point and just say, boil it down to, oh, okay, if I eat the mushrooms, I'll be okay. And, you know, then I can have like a hamburger, or if I eat the kale, then I can have a pepperoni pizza. It doesn't work like that. You know, these are <laughs> these specific items uh, that I advised you about are just a, a handful of the items we've discovered specific mechanisms on how they can help us, and they should be on top of the background of diverse whole plant foods that you are eating every day and putting in your mouth. Let's talk a little bit. We're going to get off food for a moment and talk about two other specific items that we have um, research on that demonstrate uh, that if you pay attention to these areas, they definitely can help you fight viral illnesses such as the coronavirus. Okay. The first one is sleep. Please make sure that uh, you are getting uninterrupted and good quality sleep during these times. Sleep is a very complex domain. Uh, sometimes when we have patients come to our practice, we have to work with them for a month on trying to change the way their sleep is. But you don't need sleeping pills to get good sleep. You just need simple things to be done. They're called sleep hygiene methods uh, and, and practices and, and changes in your behavior. And most of the time, people can get good sleep. We do know if your sleep architecture or the structure of your sleep is not adequate, that you are more likely to get infected and get sick from respiratory viruses. Uh, the last thing I wanted to tell you is that um, uh, I know these days, in the past maybe decade, the checking of vitamin D has become very commonplace, the surveillance of vitamin D levels in people. And, um, you know, until fairly recently, the only reason why we were checking vitamin D is was we figured vitamin D is necessary to build bones and to give us a good bone mineralization, which is true. But we've come to realize in the past few years that really it's not so much a vitamin as it is a hormone. It is a chemical director that directs many actions in our body. And guess 
what we've learned, that vitamin D has receptors on these important lymphocytes, these immune military soldiers that we have in our, our system. And we now know that vitamin D is essential and, 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 and high enough levels to make our immune system active in fighting for us, for example, against the coronavirus. So please, um, if you have a vitamin D deficiency, I would at this time make sure that you're taking enough vitamin D to get your vitamin D levels, you know, hopefully at least to the lower range of normal, which is between 30 and 100, you know, maybe up to 40, that would be good enough. And, uh, you know, just a little personal remembrance and anecdote. Um, you know, I, uh, for years, lived in Hudson County. And um, uh, during the Depression era, um, there was an enormous hospital built uh, uh, for tuberculosis at, at um, at the Jersey City Medical Center. And uh, I would drive past this hospital and see uh, in the old days that the, the, at the ends, end, uh, the ends of the building on every floor, they had solarium where they would wheel out the patients who were infected with tuberculosis and let them sit out in the sun. And even before there were medicines for tuberculosis, and by the way, the cure to tuberculosis came from a New Jersey farm, from a good soil and a chicken farm in Monmouth County. Even before that happened, uh, during World War II, uh, the primary treatment of tuberculosis was to put people in sunny, dry areas. And we now think uh, the reason why this was a successful treatment was because uh, people who were inside all day finally got exposed to the sun. Their vitamin D levels went up, and, and the vitamin D prompted their immune systems to kill off the tuberculosis and help them to survive. Um, I think somebody, if somebody could mute their phone, that would be, thank you very much. So let's see what else do I have to say. We're gonna we're gonna just a, a, a uh, yes about treatment. Um, uh, one of our patients uh, the other day was questioning uh, us about some treatment. At this day day time, there is no formalized approved treatment uh, for um, coronavirus. There are some things that are being tried. Uh, off-label, but it's, it's not clear that they are that they can be helpful. Some people think yes, some people think no. Um, there's a very old malaria, anti-malaria medication called hydroxychloroquine, which is being tried, but some studies have shown that it, it may not be effective. Um, uh, there are other antiviral medicines. There's a, a medicine, uh, an antivirus medicine, which was created for the Ebola virus, uh, and that is being tried, but we don't really have enough information on it yet. And for the most severe cases, the people who go into respiratory failure, sometimes on compassionate use, uh, a, a powerful anti-immune drug called Actemra is being utilized to block the person's immune system from dragging them down. Um, so those are some choices. There are even anti-AIDS drugs that are being used, but we really don't have any uh, uh, a, a large amount of evidence on on these drugs' efficacies at this time. So, um, what I'm going to do is we're going to take some questions in a few moments, Asha. Uh, I just wanted to show you uh, or just. I alluded to some links before, and I wanted to give you our contact information. And by the way, we prepared, if you want the, the links to these, the papers that I referred to regarding how plant, whole plant foods can, can uh, revolutionize our immune system and the specific uh, items on blueberries and mushrooms and cruciferous vegetables, uh, 
Asha will tell you. Asha, how can how can our guests get these links? Asha? Yes, yes, Dr. I think you'll send it to so, them. Maybe you'll yeah. send them. So, send them hi, everybody. Email. Yes, hi, everybody. What we are planning to do is at the end of the, um, by hopefully my team by tomorrow, day after, within a day or two, uh, any additional things that Dr. White, he, you know, right before the call started, he said, oh, should I have these two things that we should add. So I will assemble all that information and then we will send it to you when you, uh, whatever email address you've registered for, it will be sent to the, that email, um, all of these links that Dr. Weiss is talking. Okay, so um, I, Dr. Weiss, I, one more I thing. referenced before. I... Sorry, sorry. Um, on the, on your, if you're on the computer, on the top left, there's a Q&A mode where you can type in your question. And if for any reason you want to raise your hand on the top of the screen, there's also a, you know, uh, like a white way you can, you can raise your hand. So there are two options. Or you can ask questions uh, through that uh, Q&A mode. That's all. I wanted to just specify those. Okay. So I, I mentioned before, <laughs> uh, I uh, at the top of the screen you'll see our Instagram account. I post. I made a little crazy video the other day and posted uh, how doctors are are instructed to wash their hands. I know you you think I'm obsessive compulsive after seeing this video, but in this day and age you would probably appreciate it. Uh, just be aware that um, you know I demonstrate how each surface, including the palm surface, the backs of the hands, the thumbs. The, the surfaces in between the fingers and even the wrists are to be washed to destroy and mitigate the coronavirus. And I think the video is like three minutes long. Uh, suffice it to say, you don't have to wash your hands for three minutes. Um, really, it only takes, I think, it's probably between 30 to 60 minutes. As long as you spend that much time, you're good to go. So. Um, uh, oh, I, I missed the, where is that screen again, Asha? So, right, the Instagram, the Instagram, if you go to Instagram, right, that top address, Dr. Ron Weiss, you'll see the video. We also um, posted, um, and I think the, at the Facebook page, it might be there as well. Uh, definitely we've posted either on Instagram and Facebook. We have posted um, uh, the New York Times articles. One gives the tips for not touching your face. And the other is an amazing article that I enjoyed reading very much on how powerful soap is, this ancient substance from prehistoric times, how it basically is so powerful against this uh, modern, modern infection. Uh, and then, of course, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Our website is ethoshealth.org, and you can see our telephone number on the bottom. And now I will take any questions you have. Dr. Weiss, if you look to your left, the screen I have, you know, it's highlighted. We could start with the first question. Um, Alton Brown had a hand washing video too. He said bar soap was better than liquid, but didn't say why. What do you think? Um, you know, I think it, 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 soap is soap. It, it is the lipid molecules in the soap that, that tear apart the, in, the in contagion, the, the membrane around and the envelopes around the viruses and the bacteria and separate them out and carry them away. So it, it doesn't matter if it's bar, it doesn't matter if it's liquid. What matters is that you cover the surfaces and that you apply friction for a long enough period of time. As long as you do that and use the technique that we show in the, in the video, you're, you'll be fine. And by the way, you do not, do not get antibacterial soaps. You just need soap. It doesn't have to have, 
this antibacterium label on it. There are some very toxic substances in antibacterial soaps, such as triclosan, which uh, are harmful to human health and very harmful to our environment. Uh, and they, we think they hang around permanent in our, permanently in our environment once it gets into the water supply. It may affect, uh, it may affect bacteria, natural bacteria in our environment. So please don't use antibacterial soap. What else do we have for you, Ashi? Sorry, yeah. Um, so next question is, mushroom question, is half a cup measurement before cooking the mushroom or after cooking them? I always like eating more than less. So I, you know, mushrooms shrink down considerably. So I do it after cooking. Okay. All right. Um, the next question And remember, is, remember, just, just another, another, uh, another tip. Remember that the white button mushrooms are from the genus Agaricus. All of the members of this family in, uh, have a substance which is a, a quite a potent carcinogen called a garotene. These mushrooms include the white button mushrooms, large and small the portobello mushroom, which is a very close cousin of white button, the cremini mushroom, the baby portobello mushroom. These mushrooms, you should never eat them raw. They should always be cooked. Cooking That's in right. heat helps to destroy this carcinogenic material. There's a question, this question hand raised by Linda. Linda, do you want to speak your question? Uh, yeah, hang back to us. Uh, if we have to fly, if we have to fly, um, we have to fly um, back to New Jersey, um, any special precautions? Yes, uh, you know, I would, I would probably take the precautions that I've already mentioned. Always be aware of where your hands are, and do not put them to your face. I would. I would wear a mask on the plane because quarters are so close there. You know, I, I am a doctor at City MD as well, and I do a lot of urgent care. And when people are within close contact, you do want to wear a mask. You know, masks are not useful for walking around outside because you should be staying away from people. But when you're in close contact with people, which you are in a plane, if someone sneezes in the next row over from you, you know, those droplets could enter your space. I, I would wear a mask. Um, and uh, if you don't have to fly, I wouldn't fly. But um, you know, if you do fly, I would take those precautions. Mask, keep your hands down. Make sure all the surfaces you touch, uh, be aware of what you're touching, and then sanitize your hands afterwards. And by the way, you, you can use the same hand washing technique I demonstrated with the soap by using Purell. So you can keep that in your pocket. Can I, I'm going to give the next question, uh, read out the next question. Uh, 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 my sister walks outside every day with a few friends. Is this considered safe if the six foot distance is maintained? It is. It is considered safe. Uh, I mean, if you maintain six feet between you, yes, I think that's a good idea, and I recommend it so you can get some a little sunshine and fresh air and liberation from your isolation. Yeah. Uh, there is uh, Patty Cohn. She raised her hand. Patty, do you want to ask a question? Uh, you might have, have you muted yourself? I think you're unmuted on our end. Okay, I'll go to the next one. Nikki Green, do you want to ask a question? Hi, Nikki. Uh, 
Uh, if you are having trouble with your mic, feel free to type your questions on the top left. In the meantime, I'll start reading the next question, Dr. White. When it comes to the cruciferous vegetables, can they be uh, e eaten organic raw or cooked? Thank you. Uh, so we always recommend uh, well-grown vegetables uh, versus vegetables grown with pesticides and poison sprinkled on them. You know, the vegetables are so powerful. Plants, vegetables, fruits, and plant foods are so powerful, and they have so many molecules to help us that all things given, just eating pesticide-laden ones will help you. But we definitely know that well-grown produce that is grown without pesticides has up to 50% more of the plant molecules that help boost up our immune system and that help calm our immune system. So I would definitely do organic if I can possibly get it. If you can't get it, then you have to take the conventional. As far as right. cooking, um, so uh, we like to cook and to cook and eat raw in different combinations, all of our plant foods, but there are some there are some that are especially powerful when eaten raw, and those are the greens. Greens tend to lose important nutrients when they're cooked. So um, in general, although I can think of one right now, when kale is cooked, it actually increases uh, a, a, an important um, pigment for your eye that prevents macular degeneration over raw kale. But suffice it to say, um, I would try to eat your greens raw. You'll get a lot more bang for your buck. If you want to eat some cooked, that's fine too. But raw is the preference. All right. Thank you, Dr. White. What else do we yeah. have? Okay. What can we wash food in to remove possible contamination on it? Contam what kind of contamination? Uh, that was their question. Maybe I'll let them post their question again. Do you want to move to well, the next Well, let's question? think of the contamination. So, well, you don't have to post because I can, I can imagine. So contamination from other people who are in the supermarket and sneezed on your lettuce, that kind of contamination, I'm thinking, or someone who handled, who was in Whole Foods and you're in the shop, right, and they had coronavirus and they touched the head of lettuce and put it back. I get it. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I never really... <laughs> I never created that scenario for, for myself before. So if I were worried about that, I think I would cook it. I would cook that head of lettuce. Um, you know, it depends how washable something is. You know, if, if, if like you're buying a grapefruit, you could wash it with soap, the outside of it. That's very readily washing it or an orange. People will touch a grapefruit if they're contaminated. You can wash it and scrub it, and then you can peel it, and then it would be all right to eat, based on the techniques I already showed, told you about. But uh, I think it would have to be, you'd have to give me consider one food at a time to consider. At the end of the day, I guess if you cook things, you know, and if you cook them at high temperatures, it'll kill the virus. Uh, as far as other kinds of contamination from pesticides or from, uh, uh, well, chemicals, you know, washing is the best method, although with, as far as pesticides are concerned, sometimes the pesticides get inside the plant, some of the more modern pesticides, so it may be difficult. But um, I think that would be my answer to that question. So the next question is, uh, let's go. What happened? Okay, to have baked mushrooms just plain cooked on parchment paper. My favorite. I like putting them on the top rack under broil. Keep them there for eight minutes. Preheat to broil on the top rack 
on parchment paper or a Pyrex glass dish. I try not to put them on aluminum foil or an aluminum pen because the aluminum gets into the food. Um, so either a Pyrex dish or a parchment paper, and you broil for eight minutes, delicious. I just eat them like that, pop in my mouth. Let them cool. From Lisa, does it come through sweat? I want to play tennis with a friend, even if we wash our Respiratory hands. Respiratory droplets. Respiratory droplets. It doesn't come through sweat. So you have to remember something. Respiratory droplet means you're playing tennis, and then your nose runs a little bit. You go like this. You have your respiratory secretions on your hand. You pick up the tennis ball, and you hit the tennis ball to your friend. And if you have coronavirus, they will get it when they pick up the tennis ball. So always remember the hands to the face. It cannot come from your sweat being transferred to somebody else. Okay, next question. There's a shortage of fresh veggies here. Is frozen good, which I have, and blueberries are sh in short supply. Also, can you talk a little bit about benefits of breathing slash meditation to help your immune system? Yes. Well, Asha, I'm going to let you I'm going to ma mention a word, and then if you want to say anything, because I know Asha is certified in MBSR, which is one of the highest levels of mindful meditation there is. But um, so the first question is about first question is about the frozen vegetables. Uh, so yes, I have firsthand knowledge of this because my a daughter, Rosie, for her for her seventh grade science project this year, actually measured vitamin C levels in frozen strawberries and frozen mangoes versus fresh varieties, and we were astonished to find she won she won second place place in the entire science fair. So good was her experiment, and we were astonished to find that the frozen varieties had more vitamin C than the fresh varieties, probably because the freezing process um, preserved and made the vitamin C more available. So in general, frozen is a fantastic uh, alternative to eating fresh. I enjoy general uh, fresh things more than, than um, frozen. But the way it works with the freezing process uh, is that the items are usually frozen right there in the field. So they're like, they're picked and then they're put into suspended animation, like it, within hours of being picked. When you buy something from California in the fresh produce department, it's probably a week old already. And it may have lost some of, some of its nutrient value. As far as the blueberries specifically are combined, um, a favorite of mine is the wild blueberries. Our kids love those. Uh, you can buy them in bulk in Costco, and in, and uh, and they have smaller bags, which are reasonably priced. They're much more inexpensive than the fresh ones are, um, and they're wild. They're the small uh, blueberries that originally came off high bush blueberries um, that were again a piece of New Jersey history. They were they were cultivated in New Jersey around a hundred years ago by a woman by the name of Elizabeth White and developed into the modern large eating blueberry. But today you can get these these little blueberries, Yasha. You can get these little blueberries uh, in their original form and uh, they're frozen. They're called wild blueberries. They're generally low bush blueberries. But uh, they're, they've been shown to have um, superior levels of phytonutrients compared to the larger fresh eating blueberries that we can see. Oh, sec part B. Um, part B is uh, about the meditation. So we know that stress and anxiety, depression, stress, and anxiety does undermine our immune system's ability to fight, fight cancer. 
fight infection. And even when our immune system is overactive, like an autoimmune disease, it has clearly been shown that stress can worsen autoimmune disease symptoms like rheumatoid arthritis and multiple sclerosis. This is well documented. So as part of our practice, what we always teach our patients as a key part of our programs is to adopt mindful practices, to be in the moment, calm anxiety and stress. And Asha, you know, you're certified in this. Would you like to say a word about how powerful this can be for this day and age? Sure, sure, definitely I'll do that. Um, when this... Hi, everybody. Um, Hi. There is enough evidence that uh, a lot of our chemistry can change when we do mindfulness. So even if, we, even if we did it for one minute as a group, all of us, we're like 44 people up here in this, uh, you know, amazing time together. And even if for one minute if we all, um, you know, we don't have to close our eyes, but we'll focus on our breathing just for one minute and let's experience how powerful that one minute can be. I'll probably just share that this is just a time where mindfulness is the most another powerful um, tool for anxiety uh, because our mind almost has these monkey thoughts that swing from one end to the other because every day, every hour, the news keeps changing and uh, we all, the whole world has an effect. But if we focus on breathing in and breathing out, just a couple of minutes every day, and as you just do it, just see how powerful it can get. We will be able to see the difference between, you know, when we're breathing in and breathing out. Suddenly a thought will come in and we'll be able to differentiate how it's only a thought, but this is a, this is the present. Dr. Weiss today spoke about amazing things that we all can put it into practice, into our lifestyle, and we will be able to fight this together. Together we'll be able to do this. So I can tell you that there's enough uh, evidence. I'll try to dig up some articles and also put it into the um, the information that we'll be sending, how mindfulness and meditation uh, can change the way we feel, the anxious feeling. We'll be able to differentiate being in the present and we'll be able to deal uh, with our stress in a little bit. Well, it's, it's not about accepting it, but it, it's about knowing that this is a stressful situation and knowing what steps am I going to take. So that, those are some of the things. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Asha. Is there, um, is, is, there is, is there anyone, is there anyone on the call who doesn't know what a, who is not sure of what a diet of whole plant foods is, or who is unfamiliar with this, who has a question? Please ask it if you, if you wish to. Any other questions, Asha?
Oh, Dr. White, sorry. I didn't yeah. realize that I was on mute. Uh, so the question is, do other examples of the cold and flu results in similar cascade of respiratory distress as is demonstrated in this current novel coronavirus? Um, well, you know, uh, we had a we had a very scary episode, actually. Asha, you can you can speak to that. Uh, 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 Asha's family member in India uh, uh, last year, who was in the prime of life in her late 40s, was stricken with the influenza virus, and she was otherwise well, and she immediately, well, not immediately, but within like two days, went into respiratory distress and went into respiratory failure and had this condition known as acute respiratory distress syndrome. It is a life-threatening disease with like a 50% mortality death rate. And uh, she basically was near death for many weeks on a ventilator. This is the, this, this is the problem. Uh, the main problem where you see people dying in the, uh, uh, for example, there was this family in New Jersey, this horrific story where three people in the same family from Morris County, I'm sorry, from Monmouth County died in the past couple of days. Um, a mother and two adult children. Uh, you know, it shuts down your respiratory system, fluid fills your lungs, and you just can't. There's no way, not even a breathing machine can get oxygen in there. Um, you know, Asha attended to her relative and, and stayed in India for about a month, giving her whole plant foods. And sure enough, she today, uh, after about a month of being in the intensive care unit, she is walking around a normal person today. She made it. But many people don't make it. Um, the the, the other diseases besides uh, coronavirus and influenza virus that cause this ARDS, ARDS, uh, are sepsis commonly. Um, in other words, blood poisoning from bacteria swimming in your blood. Uh, that's a common one. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very bad and life-threatening condition. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. This will be our last question, uh, Dr. Weiss. Um, yes. And we, do you think we will be able to see if we had the virus? I think we had it in our home three, four weeks ago before all the announcements, et cetera. We made it through fine, my husband, myself, and five-year-old twins. Well, uh, wonderful. So I wouldn't worry about it anymore. Uh, you know, you should clean your surfaces with disinfectant uh, that kill viruses, and I would just let it be. You know, the, the coronavirus, as far as we know, on hard surfaces, it probably can last for hours. On soft surfaces, like fabrics, it may last days, up to a week. But if you say it was a month ago, it is unlikely to be alive, and I, I wouldn't mind it anymore. And look, you spend a month in that environment not getting sick. So I think the best advice I can give you is to do a mindful practice and become calm. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, I, uh, I wish you the best, uh, all of our prayers and blessings for, for anyone who has uh, the illness for a good outcome and um